everybody. Welcome to Learn With Seth. This is one of the videos as part of our Lessons in Law series. The focus is on OCR A-Level Law, but it will be useful to anybody studying law. If you like the videos, please do subscribe and press the like button at the bottom. This lesson is one of four on judicial precedent. It's within part of the OCR A-Level course for paper two, lawmaking. And a lot of candidates um, see this as quite a tricky, tricky topic, probably because there's a lot of cases and quite a few unusual terms that you need to know. So in order to succeed in this topic, you need to understand what judicial precedent means and all the related terms such as starter theses, ratio dissidenti and evicta dicta. You also need to be able to explain the different types of precedent, binding precedent, persuasive and original ones. And then you also need to be able to explain how judicial precedent op operates um, within the hierarchy of courts using the concepts of following, overruling, reversing and distinguishing. And finally, you might get a 15 mark evaluation question on judicial precedent. So you also need to know the advantages and disadvantages of it. In this first lesson, we're going to be looking at what is judicial precedent. and We're going to be exploring some of the key terms. So by the end of this session, you should be able to explain star deceases, ratio dissidendi, obicta dicta, and the different types of precedent. First of all, the meaning of judicial precedent. But let's just think about this for a while. You probably already know what the word judicial means from your study of paper one. You might not have ever heard of the word precedent. Notice it's precedent, so it's not like the president of the United States. It's precedent. So judicial means judge and president means de decision. So we're looking at judge made law. So law made in the courts. And we talk about it being a doctrine of precedent. So that word doctrine is another new word that you might not, might not know. It means rules or principles. about the doctrine of judicial precedent, we're talking about the legal rules set in courts that must be followed. Basically, the idea is when a legal principle is made by a judge in a case, it binds all future judges in similar cases. And that's what this topic is all about. It works on the principle of star deceases, star deceases, which basically means stand by what has been decided. In other words, once a judge has laid down a legal principle in a case, future similar cases must be decided in the same way. So future similar cases must stand by what has already been decided. And it's this principle of standing by what has been decided in earlier cases that makes judicial precedent binding on future cases. It's always good to have an example. If you've already studied tort law, you will be very familiar with Donoghue versus Stevenson already. If you haven't, then this is a case which you're going to know very, very well. So Donoghue versus Stevenson in 1932. Basically, the claimant um, wanted to pour some ginger beer over her ice cream. And um, that was the thing to do in 1932 Scotland. And she found um, after she'd already had some of the ginger beer, she found a decomposing snail in her bottle. She suffered um, some sort of stomach complaint afterwards. 
The House of Lords held in this case that a manufacturer owed a duty of care to their neighbour, who in this case was the consumer, to ensure that their products are safe. In other words, because otherwise it will cause harm, such as the stomach condition. And this principle of duty of care, where you owe um, duty to a neighbour to prevent them from harm, has become the foundation of negligence law today. So when Grant v Australian Knitting Mills came along four years later in 1936, it was decided in the same way as Donoghue versus Stevenson because Donoghue versus Stevenson became a binding president. So in Grant v Australian Knitting Mills, the claimant brought some long johns, um, but the material contained a chemical and that caused skin irritation. He was awarded compensation because the manufacturer owed a duty of care to his consumer against harm. Hence the principle laid down in Donoghue versus Stevenson bound Grant v Australian Knitting Mills and since has bound all similar cases. And this is also a very good example for original president. So that means that there hasn't been an earlier decision. So the principle of duty of care laid down in Donoghue versus Stevenson had never been decided before in a court. So because it is decided in Donoghue versus Stevenson, it became an original president. Ratio dissidendi is another term that you need to know. Ratio dissidendi means the reason for the decision, the exact reason for the decision. And it's this reason that becomes binding. So in Donoghue versus Stevenson, yes, a manufacturer owes a duty of care to their consumer because they've got to prevent them from harm. So a duty of care is owed arising from reasonably foreseeable acts or omissions that might cause harm. Now, it, that might seem very straightforward that one case will lead, lead a bind, will lead to a binding precedent on another. But sometimes it's actually quite difficult to see what the ratio dissidendi is. That's because judges um, in a case will make a written judgment. We're talking about, of course, appeal or higher courts here. They will make a judgment and sometimes those judgments are very long and it will only be a small part of the judgment that will be the ratio dissidendi. And sometimes several different judges will make a written judgment. And sometimes there may be more than one ratio in a case, and it will be up to future cases to establish exactly what the ratio dissidendi for a case is. So again, let's have a look at this with another example. You may remember Dudley and Stevens. We studied this in one of our first videos. If you remember, um, the crew of a ship were, were shipwrecked, they were on a lifeboat and they decided the only way they were going to survive was to eat the cabin boy. They claimed in court that had they not eaten the cabin boy, they would have died. So their defence to murder was necessity. However, the 1884 court held that they could not use the defence of necessity. So the rule is the legal principle is you cannot use the rule of you cannot use the defence of necessity for murder. And that remains today. However, the ratio dissidendi is the reason for the decision. The ratio dissidendi in Dudley and Stevens why you can't use necessity for murder is one, because Christian values 
state that you should give up your own life to save another rather than to take another's life to save one's own. Two, it's impossible to choose between the value of one person's life and another. And three, if you can't use the defense of necessity to steal food, then you shouldn't be able to use the defense of necessity to kill someone. So what is binding precedent? Binding precedent is the rule or the principle that has to be followed in future similar cases. Remember that it's that ratio dissidendi that's binding. And precedent is only binding if it comes from a court higher in the hierarchy. So that means the Supreme Court binds all courts below it. In addition to this, these appeal courts usually have to follow their own decisions. And this is called binding themselves. But they only are bound by a binding precedent if the facts of the case are sufficiently similar. And we're going to look at this idea in a little bit more detail in our next video. So higher courts find lower courts, and usually those higher courts or appeal courts find themselves. And as we've seen, the ratio dissidendi of Donahue versus Stevenson has bound all future similar cases such as Grant v Australian knitting meals. And then you've got this idea of a bit to dicta. That's other things said. So within a judge's judgment, as I've said, there will only be a small part that will be the binding precedent, the ratio dissidendi. Everything else, statements made by the judge that are not essential to the actual decision, are called obicta dicta. And obicta dicta comments are not binding on future cases. However, they may be persuasive, so they may influence a future case. Let's see how this works. In the case of R.V. Howe, there's a good example of comments in the judgment that are ratio dissidendi and obicta dicta. Let's look at the facts of the case. So Howe and his friend Bailey, they were both aged 19. And then there was also another person called Bannister, aged 20. Now, these three individuals were acting under the orders of a 35 year old man called Murray. The case involved charges of two murders and one conspiracy to murder. The first murder involved a 17 year old man called Elgar. And basically, Elgar was driven by the 35 year old Murray to a public loo. He was naked, he was crying, he was very frightened. And whilst he was there, he was tortured and he was made to undergo various sexual perversions. In addition to this, Howe and Bannister kicked him and punched him and did this, according to them, under the threat of Murray. And eventually, Bailey strangled Elgar to death. The second killing, which took place the next night at the same location, involved a 19 year old. And again, Murray ordered Howe and Bannister to strangle this 19 year old and they complied. And then the third charge, which was conspiracy to murder, was quite similar. But in this case, the victim managed to escape. How claimed what was called duress, and again, you may have studied this in your study of Paper 1 Criminal Law. 
So duress is, of course, where you are compelled to act, to compelled to commit a crime under the direct threat of physical violence or death upon yourself or someone that you're um, responsible for. So let's have a look at um, Lord Griffith's um, judgment. Let's have a read of it. And as we read it, try and work out what the ratio dissidenti and obicta dicta is in this judgment. So work out what the exact binding president is going to be. My lords, in my view, we should decline to extend the defence to the actual killer. If the defence is not available to the killer, what justification can there be for extending it to others who have played their part in the murder? It is therefore neither rational nor fair to make the defence dependent upon whether the accused is the actual killer or took some other part in the murder. I declare the law to be that duress is not available as a defence to a charge of murder or to attempted murder. I add attempted murder because it has to be remembered that the prosecution have to prove an even more evil intent to convict of attempted murder than in actual murder. Attempted murder requires proof and intent to kill, whereas in murder, it is sufficient to prove an intent to cause really serious harm. So what part of that judgment do you think became binding? And what part is just a bit to dicta, other things said? you've worked out that the ratio dissidenti is that duress is not available to the charge of murder and the obit to dicta is it also shouldn't be available to attempted murder as well so cases that followed rv how that was to do with murder committed under duress meant that the defendant could not use the defense of duress for murder. However, if we look at R.V. Gotts, in this case, the boy attempted to kill his mother. He actually tried to stab her to death. And he claimed he did this because of threats his father made to him. So he was under duress, he claimed. The judge followed the obit to dicta statements in how. So if you remember, in how, obit to dicta, the judge stated it's probably shouldn't all shouldn't be available for attempted murder either. So in Gotts, they followed the obit to dicta statements made in how, and they declared that the defense of duress is not available for attempted murder. And hence, that became a ratio dissidenti, and now R.V. Gotts is binding precedent for any case involving attempted murder. Hopefully, you're beginning to see how it works. So persuasive precedent isn't binding, but might influence a judge. And there are five different types of persuasive precedent. You've got obit to dicta statements, such as R.V. Gotts. And these obit to dicta statements could also be hypothetical situations that the judge makes. So a judge might say, if the case had been this, we might have ruled this. And a good example of that is in Maloney. There are also persuasive precedents made by the Privy Council. And again, if you have studied tort law, you will be well familiar with wagon mound. There are dissenting judgments, such as those made by the different judges in R.V. Brown, a key case used in the defence of consent, so related to your criminal law study of paper one. Sometimes judges refer 
refer to decisions of courts made in other countries, such as RE-F, um, where the pregnant woman refused to have a cesarean, even though um, it was going to save hers and the baby's life. And then um, persuasive precedents could also be decisions made by lower courts. And a good example of this is RVR. Let's have a look at this case. So in RVR 1991, we're talking about it when it went to the House of Lords. So it went to the highest court at the time in 1991. It's the marital rape case. So at the time, the defendant and the lady were living apart, but he forced himself into her parents' home and raped her. Now, at the time, it was believed that there was a to um, an immunity from prosecution, from criminal liability for a husband who rape rapes his wife. And it was felt that this was about 20, 250 years old, this immunity. Basically, it was believed that when a wife married her husband, she gave consent for him to use her body. So um, if you like, automatic sexual relations were consented to upon marriage. Well, in RVR, the defendant was found guilty of raping his wife. And the reason for this was that they, did, they believed that the immunity was deemed outdated. And in this case, the House of Lords followed the decision made by the Court of Appeal. In other words, they were persuaded by the decision of an inferior court. Have a go at writing an answer to a question. So in this question, it asks you to explain the doctrine of precedent looking particularly at the terms ratio dissidendi and obit to dicta. And I've tried to divide the success criteria up into three clear paragraphs, ready for a 10 mark answer. Try doing this to time. You should allow yourself 10 minutes. Hopefully you now know the meaning of precedent, star decisis, ratio dissidendi, and obitta dicta. And hopefully you also can explain now the different types of precedents, binding, persuasive, and original. In our next judicial precedent video, we're going to look at some of the operation, focusing on the words following, overruling, reversing, and distinguishing. Make sure you tune in. That brings us to the end of this lesson in law. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like it and subscribe to find more videos. Bye.